What would happen if we built infrastructure that was built locally here that we can be proud of? We are the only internet provider headquartered in Cleveland. So for us, being able to have this emphasis on local, local ownership, local operations, supporting local, what does that mean for the telecommunications market when all these decisions usually from our competitors are made at the shareholder national level, if not global? How does Cleveland fit into that? And we don't wait to try and figure that out. For us, we're taking a proactive stance and saying, Cleveland has this pervasive digital divide and everybody here is affected by it. If I'm the small business owner who has a product online and someone doesn't have internet, they're not buying my business. So those are the things where it's like, no, we are all affected by the digital divide. Let us, Cleveland, figure out what works best for Cleveland. That's not to say that these other companies can't exist here or that we can't coexist. I mean, I'm sure we will. But at the end of the day, our approach is they are our competitors and we are seeking to alter, if not totally disrupt, the way America thinks about telecommunications And that ground zero is going to be Cleveland, Ohio. Let's discover what people are building in the greater Cleveland community. We are telling the stories of Northeast Ohio's entrepreneurs, builders, and those supporting them. Welcome to the Lay of the Land podcast, where we are exploring what people are building in Cleveland and throughout Northeast Ohio. I am your host, Jeffrey Stern, and today I had the real pleasure of speaking with Joshua Edmonds, the CEO of Digital C. The digital divide, this gap between people who have access to the internet and those who do not, is something you may have heard me bring up a few times before on this podcast. While not uniquely a Cleveland issue, Cleveland historically has been one of the worst connected large cities in the country with roughly 35% of Cleveland households lacking at-home internet access. Digital C, a nonprofit which is based in Huff, right in Midtown Cleveland, was founded in 2015 to bridge this very digital divide and build out a citywide network infrastructure to ensure an equitable digital future for all Clevelanders. To this end, with the backing of the Ohio Department of Development's Broadband Ohio, the City of Cleveland, amongst other funders, Digital C has conditionally secured over $30 million in funding to offer affordable, fast, and reliable connectivity to the city. Joshua came to lead Digital C after serving as the first municipal director of digital inclusion for the city of Detroit, where he had established the Office of Digital Inclusion, developed Detroit's first municipal fiber optic broadband plan, oversaw the deployment of over $70 million to bolster digital equity in Detroit, testified in front of Congress on that matter and established a 600-plus member public-private partnership to the same end. Joshua had made his way to Detroit originally by way of Cleveland, though, after serving as a Digital Innovation Fellow at the Cleveland Foundation and returned to Cleveland in 2022 to help Digital C reorient around realizing its immediate goals of enrolling roughly 25,000 Cleveland households in Canopy, Digital C's $18 per month internet plan, offering upload and download speeds of 100 megabits per second. This was an awesome conversation. Joshua and I cover internet connectivity as a basic human right, the history and evolution of the digital divide and digital redlining in Cleveland, the importance of digital literacy beyond mere access to the internet, how Digital C plans to make all of this a reality, the opportunity for Cleveland to set an aspirational example for other cities on how to actually bridge the digital divide, and Joshua's journey throughout all of this. So please enjoy my conversation with Joshua Edmonds after a brief message from our sponsor. Lay of the Land is brought to you by John Carroll University's Bowler College of Business, widely recognized as one of the top business schools in the region. As we've heard time and time again from entrepreneurs here on Lay of the Land, many of whom are proud alumni of John Carroll University, success in this ever-changing world of business requires a dynamic and innovative mindset, deep understanding of emerging technologies and systems, strong ethics, leadership prowess, acute business acumen, all qualities nurtured through the Bowler College of business. With four different MBA programs of study spanning professional, online, hybrid, and one-year flexible, the Bowler College of Business provides flexible timelines and various class structures for each MBA track, including online, in-person, hybrid, and asynchronous. 
all to offer the most effective options for you, including the ability to participate in an elective international study tour, providing unparalleled opportunities to expand your global business knowledge by networking with local companies overseas and experiencing a new culture. The career impact of a Bowler MBA is formative and will help prepare you for this future of business and get more out of your career. To learn more about John Carroll University's Bowler MBA programs, please go to business.jcu.edu. The Bowler College of Business is fully accredited by AACSB International, the highest accreditation a college of business can have. Cool. Okay. So I was thinking about where to start and it brought me back to when we had first met when I moved to Cleveland many years ago. And it was in the context of this this hackathon that you were organizing at the intersection of, of civics, technology, and, and housing. And so for me, as long as I have known you, well before even your time at Digital C, you've been interested in this intersection of those things, civic innovation, digital inclusion. And I would love to hear from you where that curiosity and passion stems from. Yeah, so the curiosity really stems from video games. You know, I grew up playing the Super Nintendo and obviously a lot of the subsequent systems, you know, were part of the Halo generation. So, you know, (laughs) (laughs) technology was definitely a thing there. Even overlaying like sci-fi, like I've always just had like this affinity. And my dad also had brought us a uh, Windows 95 computer. And so I remember going to the library, getting computer games from there, bringing them back home, but also just exploring and playing around with the control panel, the terminal settings, like just any and everything. It it just allowed us to foster, tap into the sense of ingenuity. And I would say that that love and that appreciation there is something that I want to share with others. I think that it really unlocked so many elements of me, the strategic thinking, the you know, try, try again attitudes. I would say that a lot of those games, and you know this too, early on, they didn't have save points. If you, if you, if you died in that level, <laughs> you had to go all the way back to the beginning. That's, just, that's how those games were. And so it taught you patience. It taught you mastery. And I would say that, you know, a lot of the skills that are fundamental for having success, even in technology, I credit that to video games. And, you know, I, I, I want others to be able to experience that foundational, that creative, ingenuity that I got to experience. I believe that's where the intersection between the appreciation for technology and broader civic understanding comes from. Yeah, I love I love that as the origin of a lot of your interest in this because I share the the sentiment that that video games are are quite underrated as you know, not wasted time. They, they you know, truly as something that opened I think the door to a lot of people to some really formative things. And, and learnings. And so they're, they're quite powerful. And they, they haven't, I've never looked back on that time as wasted time because I, I share that they've taught me a lot of things about the real world as well. So I, I definitely want to hear a bit more about your journey, but I also wanted to do a definition of, of terms of sorts, specifically in the context of, of Cleveland, because I, I think it'll just be topics that kind of permeate the, the whole conversation. When most people think about human rights, I don't think that the right to internet access or the right to broadband or however you may phrase it is what might come to mind amidst, you know, all the fundamental human rights. But as our civilization and society has evolved, particularly, I think, highlighted by the situation many found themselves in over the pandemic, they are requisite considerations. And even organizations like the United Nations have come to recognize them now in the same elk as they do the rights to freedom of expression, education, and others. And so I wanted to, just from your perspective, you know, understanding that even with the origins of your interest in the space stemming from video games, which, you know, maybe to many isn't a serious topic, how serious this actually is as just a a place to start from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I look at this and I, I go back to there's the late 90s. So we can stay in the 90s for a second. Great. A great time. <laughs> a great time. Larry Irving, he's an incredible thought leader in the telecommunication digital equity space. And he was working for the Clinton administration. And he saw the rollout of the Internet and he coined the term the digital divide. 
he said that, wow, the internet is going to be incredible, but if we're not thoughtful about the way that we roll this out, this will exacerbate inequity. And if we look at the 90s, while we can look and see how incredible things were, the same houses that were redlined specifically in Cleveland are some of the same houses to this day that we see are digitally redlined as well. And so the implications from looking at revolutions in the past or the lack thereof that might have created the landscape of inequality and inequity in Cleveland are the same ones that then manifest themselves digitally. And if you look at how that works in real time, you can look at the advancements in healthcare and our reliance on technology. And if that same household is digitally redlined, that same household is not going to realize a full potential of healthcare. The same thing works or goes for workforce, it goes for education. The implications are numerous. Mm -hmm. And I think that for us, if we don't take the digital divide seriously, I mean, we already saw what happened in the 90s. Now we're seeing things like artificial intelligence take over. And that's that's not all bad. I'm not one of those AI dooms, you know, day type people. But I do think that what ends up happening, if we don't have a concentrated play to get people on the right side of the digital divide, every advancement we, we make in technology, it's more work we're going to have to do on the back end. So the faster technology goes, if we're not connecting people at that same pace to set technology and empowering them to use it, we are now widening the disparity in these healthcare disparities, these workforce disparities, and become ever more present. So I, I, I appreciate that you've called out, I think, this clear overlap in what would be the causal relationship between connectivity and all these other kind of fundamentally important things, I think, even like education and poverty. And when you think about those in the context of Cleveland, while you could, you know, have a virtuous feedback loop, which I, I think is, is really at the heart of the work you're doing at, at Digital C, and, and we'll talk about that. But it, in Cleveland, that feedback loop has long been, I think, somewhat perniciously operating in reverse, mm-hmm. leaving us, you know, with the, the fallout of the digital divide and digital red lighting and kind of the, the realities of Cleveland as a place where literacy really suffers, where poverty is, is, is at its worst. That's right. And so I, I, yeah, I would love to, you know, continue to, to set the stage here of, you know, what that problem space looks like here in Cleveland, the severity of, of all these issues and how they relate to each other. How did we get to a position that we find ourselves in here in Cleveland and maybe as a backdrop to, you know, the origins of, of Digital C and the work that they all are doing there? Yeah, so we look at, and it, it's funny how people will define this because to people in the telecommunications space, when we say the term digital redlining, they don't like it Um, naturally. Mm -hmm. They'll bring it up and they'll say, well, we made business decisions. And the business decisions that were made was someone looked at the city of Cleveland and the surrounding suburbs and they said, population A is more likely to pay their bills than population B. So therefore, we are going to outline population A with the latest and greatest. We're going to give them the technology advancements. They're going to pay it off over time. And then we'll reinvest in population B. The problem with population, that that strategy, though, Mm. is it doesn't have accountability publicly. So most people don't really even understand how telecommunications infrastructure works, how it's built how essentially people are overpaying for obsolete infrastructure. I mean, you have cable and copper that was paid off years ago. I mean, some of this stuff is 100-year-old infrastructure. And yet, in people's bill, they're still paying for infrastructure and service delivery. And see, those are the type of things that when you then look at housing insecurity, you then look at poverty and how perpetual billing can disenfranchise people it starts to very clearly point to the need for an affordable and reliable solution. 100-year-old infrastructure and trying to compete with someone in a suburb who might have the infrastructure from five years ago, how that's not even comparable. At some point, we had to look at this and say, like, someone has to correct the telecommunications market 
Mm. Cleveland is ripe for that opportunity. And that's where Digital C comes in. So we looked at the history of digital redlining and in Digital C's origins, you know, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, more of a technology social enterprise, and that we are a full-fledged internet service provider. When Digital C was first starting, we were prioritizing the areas that we deemed digital equity high need areas. And us deeming those areas, we looked at where the pervasive digital redlining occurred and a number of other socioeconomic factors. We said, we're going to prioritize those areas first. Typically in the business world, they would do the inverse. Right. They're going to go where, again, all the other demographic factors look great to them, and that's going to satisfy their shareholders. We are not a shareholder company. We have a nonprofit board, but we were committed to bridging the digital divide, and we set out the mission to connect the unconnected. So our existence is in direct counter to what the business community has historically done through several iterations of redlining and digital redlining being the latest. So... Take us through your journey to, to Digital C. How is it that you have found yourself as, as the leader of this organization and what you know, kind of drew you specifically to, to this cause? Yeah, so it's interesting how life works because when you retell it, it seems really linear. But when you're in it, it just seems like, I don't know, I'm just taking jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's funny, during college, I actually did work at Best Buy. And I, I worked alongside the Geek Squad at times, so I would take customer calls. And it was interesting at that time. I didn't really know much to do with it. And, you know, people would call and they would, sometimes it would be residents saying, hey, I gave you all my bank information and you all said I was going to get this $50 gift card. I didn't, I never got my gift card. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, we never asked for your, gift, your, your bank account information. You got scammed. Mm. The amount of calls I would get from that was startling. I'm like, man, it was almost like one out of every five calls. It was a customer calling because they got scammed. And th- I didn't know what to do with that at that time. I just kind of said, huh, okay, go off to grad school. The term technology policy starts coming up more. And I'm like, hmm, that sounds interesting. So again, it was just interesting. And, you know, did a little bit of work in grad school, studying a few things. I actually studied Amazon's drone delivery program. So it's cool to see Walmart's doing that right now. Hmm. But um, separate from there, after graduation, you know, I was still figuring things out, did a fellowship in Denver that I really enjoyed. I actually studied aquaponics. Um, so like I got to understand like, oh, how technology can influence food security in underserved neighborhoods. So like that was interesting. Again, interesting. It wasn't until I got back to Cleveland. I moved back for the Cleveland Foundation Public Service Fellowship that I got to work on President Obama's Connect Home Initiative within the Chicago Metropolitan Housing Authority. And that's where the housing hackathon happened. That's where I would say the stars aligned and I got it. I'm like, okay, I've been running away from this for so long. Now I see the beginnings of purpose start to form where all the things that I found interesting were aligned with the other things that naturally I was just more privy to or just I I could excel in. So connecting with people, being able to be a spokesperson for an initiative, doing community collaborative building, like that started all through my time at the Housing Authority. And after that, I went to the Cleveland Foundation, got to work with Leon Wilson on some digital innovation initiatives and scaling Cleveland's digital equity ecosystem. Detroit plucked me, spent four years working for the mayor. That's where I would say I really got my skills honed in this space, even got up to the level where I was doing some Capitol Hill advocacy. And that's when I started seeing the full spectrum of opportunity And during that time, raised a lot of money, was able to kind of keep the pulse on Detroit's digital equity scene as related to the pandemic Mm. and got a lot of visibility. And that's when Digital C reached out. They were doing a transition and said, hey, we want someone who can think big, who can think bold, audacious, but collaborative and, you know, public sector leader. And at that time, that's exactly what I was working in the public sector. So Digital C called me and um, I took the job November 1st, 2022. Hmm. Very exciting. We're obviously, you know, glad to have you back <laughs> in Cleveland. I think perhaps one of the most interesting things about Digital C, and, and we'll talk, I think, all about the initiatives you're working on today, but is, is just kind of from the onset, the, the framing of internet as a utility. And with that, the relationship between public center and private sector 
offerings for this as a utility. And again, in contrast to, I think, what it used to be, which was not considered a utility and how it's become so ingrained. And I think upstream even of a lot of the other fundamental rights that we think about, because without internet today, you don't even have opportunity to improve literacy or mm-hmm. earning potential or a lot of the things that we hold to be, you know, these, these kind of fundamental rights. That's right. So how do you compete, you know, with the private sector? And if that's not the right framing of that question, like how do you think about it and just the services offered? No, that, no, that, that's a, absolutely right. So this is actually going to be a, a unique call callback. And some people from my old days in Cleveland, my first stint, they're going to laugh at this, but Everyone knows that I was like infatuated with BlackBerry. Um, and I actually had a BlackBerry <laughs> up until the pandemic. And then I had a girlfriend at the time who just wore me down. I finally went team iPhone, but still a BlackBerry loyalist. And I'm bringing up BlackBerry because one, the movie was incredible. So if people haven't watched the BlackBerry movie. It, it is a great movie. But they were able to be this perceivably inferior company at one point. And then they actually own majority of the smartphone marketplace worldwide. But what's even more interesting is the way that Apple was able to then just take everything from them with an actual inferior product. The iPhone was not superior to the BlackBerry from a technology standpoint. It was superior from a branded storytelling standpoint. And that's the thing that for us, yes, we are competing with all of the large companies on the internet front. You know, they don't look at us as a canoe next to a battleship. They look at us as a competitor in that field. And for us, it's a unique opportunity to disrupt the telecommunications landscape by investing differently, by thinking differently, by giving people a product that they legitimately deserve. There's so many people who can move to Cleveland who will choose provider one or provider two. I'm not going to name them because if I do, they're, they're just going to get visibility and I refuse to do that. But provider <laughs> one and provider two, they're going to get named. Or, or, or they're just going to select them. And it's not because they did a phenomenal job. They just got selected because people know them. And so at our point, it's like, okay, what happens if one, people locally can get to know us, but two, we can actually do a phenomenal job. We can stand behind our product where we can say, hey, we know perpetual billing is already something that, that people struggle with, especially in a market where a third of Clevelanders are underbanked. But what would happen if we actually locked in our prices and we didn't change them? That every six months your price didn't change or that we didn't have to lie to get someone a promotion, to get in on a promotional rate and then we're going to double the cost of the service. Like what happens if we just treated people transparently and fairly? How would they respond to that? In addition to that, what would happen if we built infrastructure that was built locally here that we can be proud of? We are the only internet provider headquartered in Cleveland. So for us, being able to have this emphasis on local, local ownership, local operations, supporting local, what does that mean for the telecommunications market when all these decisions usually from our competitors are made at the shareholder national level, if not global, how does Cleveland fit into that? And we don't wait to try and figure that out. For us, we're taking a proactive stance and saying, Cleveland has this pervasive digital divide and everybody here is affected by it. If I'm the small business owner who has a product online and someone doesn't have internet, they're not buying my business. So those are the things where it's like, no, we are all affected by the digital divide. Let us, Cleveland, figure out what works best for Cleveland. That's not to say that these other companies can't exist here or that we can't coexist. I mean, I'm sure we will. But at the end of the day, our approach is they are our competitors and we are seeking to alter, if not totally disrupt, the way America thinks about telecommunications and that ground zero is going to be Cleveland, Ohio. And what, what have you learned? What, what have you seen is at least, you know, the approaches you've taken so far, the learnings from them and how you've positioned yourself to, I think fundamentally at least alter the way people think about how this could work. Well, what we've learned at the onset is people, people here are incredibly skeptical. (laughs) And that's not a bad thing. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. I know I know where we are. And they're skeptical for a number of reasons, but I think that their skepticism is something that we had to explore. And what that looks like in real time is if we're connecting someone 
and we tell them that the service is $18 a month and no qualifications, uh, there's no way. No way. That's too good to be true. No, no, no. This, this is what it is. No, no, no. You guys are just going to. So they, 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 oftentimes people judge us from the experiences that they've had with others. Mm. And I, I mean, I get it. Fair point. I, I understand human nature. But at the same time, you know, we are now starting to see there's a block in Cleveland that we cover in Glenville. And we went door knocking there. It's a point of pride. Every home on that block has our, has our service. And it looks great to see that. I mean, it's like 20 to 25 homes in a row that all of them just green dots. And seeing those, like, that's beautiful to us that, we're, that we're, seeing, we're, we're able to overcome the skepticism, but it's loud. And I also would say that from a startup standpoint, because, you know, yeah, we're a 501c, we're a social enterprise, but we're also a startup. And from a startup standpoint, I would see that, you know, I think that we as a city, we have room for growth in the way that we support startups here. I think that there's great visibility that we're able to achieve. There's great storytelling and support. But I would say that as a community, we as a city need to figure out a way to encourage greater growth and greater startup support than what's out there right now. I think the skepticism can be very loud and the support can be somewhat silent. That's not going to deter you from doing what you're doing because this is purpose-driven work, but it's a very astute observation that makes us reframe and ask the question, is Cleveland startup friendly? Mm. Well, I have a few threads to pull on there, but I'll, I'll start you know, maybe with the, the Stockholm syndrome that I think most of us feel about internet service providers and how we literally have become accustomed psychologically to coping with how poorly we are treated, that the, the prospect of a good offering in the space puts people on guard. There's like, it sounds too good to be true. So how, right. how, <laughs> how do you actually offer such a, a compelling service at such a good price? The beautiful thing is we won a, um, a pretty big contract with the city of Cleveland last year. It's a $20 million contract. We received $10 million from the state of Ohio, $20 million from the Mandel and Myers Foundation, and a $3 million congressional earmark. So those big numbers, are, that, that's how we can do it. <laughs> but separately from there, we can do it because we're making a, an estimate on market share and the total addressable market that we can disrupt. If we're able to get 15% market penetration in Cleveland, and that's 15% of people taking our service, well, that actually, we're able to be sustainable as a company. Mm. So all we have to do is get 15%. And that's the part where it's interesting when you have a nonprofit doing this versus a for-profit. Because a for-profit, obviously, in, in the name, they're going to work and their metrics are going to make sense for a profit. A nonprofit, we have whatever profit we make that goes back into the business so we're sustainable. So to be a sustainable nonprofit, that is one of our goals. And so if we wanted to make a profit, yeah, we'd offer greater you know, packages. We wouldn't do $18. We'd do $50 or $60, or we would just lie in mass to people and then secretly over six-month increments just keep changing their bills. But since we're not motivated to do that, we don't need to do those tactics. And so our whole thing is building out this model, making it sustainable, developing a product that people deserve, and then sticking with that. I'll be honest, $18 a month product, that was developed before the pandemic. We're, we are committed to that product for the next five years with the city of Cleveland, and then we'll adjust it for inflation after that. So in reality, for the, almost a decade, our internet will be roughly $20 or less. And I think that that's phenomenal to be able to say, because that's then going to force everybody else to then acquiesce to Cleveland's rules. And so our whole thing is about getting the take rate that can sustain it, and making sure we're staying on the, the, the leading and bleeding edge as relates to our marketing, our advertising, and advancements in technology. The advancements in technology today on the wireless front allow us to think about this in a much more efficient way. And now that's not coming from me. I have one of the best chief operating officers in the game, Jose Valdez, brings more than 30 years of telecom experience, and his mind is incredible. He used to work at these large cable companies, so he sees the way that they operate. And, you know, without him, you know, I, there's no way we'd be in the position that we're in. So, I mean, I think when you say, well, how are we able to offer it? It's partly one, because we're not in it for a profit. And partly two, because we just have a phenomenal team and their expertise is unrivaled. 
How does this actually work from the the infrastructure and and technology side? You know, walk us through how the service is actually offered. You know, you mentioned, I think, in contrast to historically, you know, laying the pipes, laying the fiber. What does this look like today for Digital C? And, you know, when you think about where maybe some of this is going in the future with satellite offerings, how, how are you thinking about, you know, the, the actual offering of, of internet access? So internet is broken down a number of ways. So we are a hybrid network. And we actually even have our own technology that we coined called Hybrid X6. I can explain that more later. It sounds really cool, though. But the hybrid nature speaks to both wireless and wireline services. And what we mean by that in real time, our network runs on fiber. So there's existing fiber optic assets that run throughout the city of Cleveland and the greater Cleveland area. And those are primarily ran by commercial internet providers. So the big ones that we're typically used to subscribing at home, sometimes, but not all the time, are different from the commercial providers. So we're a residential provider, but Everstream, for example, and Crown Castle, those are two commercial fiber providers where they serve businesses, but not homes. So what we'll do is we negotiate an agreement where we will lease their fiber and their fiber might run to a building, very tall building. Let's say a building that has uh, 150 feet up. Hmm. We will then put a tower on top of those, not like a full radio tower. It could just be like a, a eight foot pole. And we will then put a radio on top of that. So the fiber runs through the building to that rooftop and then to our equipment. And then we beam that fiber and we create what's called a fiber ring in the sky. And so what that fiber ring in the sky allows us to do is build this wireless ring throughout the city. And then on the customer's home, we'll install what's called a customer premise equipment. It's not large at all. It's a small box. And then that box runs, we wire inside the house to a modem, and then they have Wi-Fi from our fiber ring in the sky. And so that goes all the way back down to the fiber underneath the ground. But again, it, a lot, it requires us to have rooftops or what we call vertical assets throughout the city. And then our radios then communicate from those buildings directly to the homes. So we're able to build this wirelessly and we're allowed to do this a lot faster than what a traditional internet provider would do where they had to dig up everyone's yard and they had to run to the house. No, with wireless, thankfully their fiber optic assets are already there. We're just tapping and beaming. Hmm. So we can go much faster with a fraction of the cost. Our customer acquisition cost is relatively low and our speed in reaching the customer and deploying a network is absolutely high, which is how we're able to outpace our competitors who are, in many cases, burdened by obsolete infrastructure that's very costly to deploy, whereas we can just, we, we can build an entire city like Cleveland in 18 months or less, whereas if we were to do the same thing for fiber, you're talking about almost a decade. Hmm. So, I mean, you genuinely see a path to, to bridge the, the digital divide. Yes, yes, yes. And this is where we are finally, finally seeing wins here. What I mean by wins, I'm not saying that we never had wins of the digital divide front because there have been several. The discipline has evolved significantly. At one point, you know, getting a resident, a laptop, a hotspot, and, you know, some training, that was the holy grail for digital inclusion at one point. Mm. Now we're so sophisticated where we say, no, not good enough. And the pandemic really exposed the, I would say the reliability of hotspots where now residents said, we need more. And so our service baseline for the $18 service is 100 upload and 100 download. What that means in real time is if you were to want to do any type of video calling or you're uploading content, your content creator, even, even you with this podcast, in order to upload it, you're going to need upload speeds. So the higher the upload speed, you know, the faster it's going to go. Simultaneously, download speeds, that's the content that we take in, whether we're watching Netflix or we're downloading large documents, whatever that is, the download speeds matter too. Now, there's other things that matter, you know, like ping and stuff like that. But however, for the sake of just brevity, the upload, the download and upload speeds mean a lot. Currently, the federal standard for high-speed internet is 100 download and 20 upload. We do 100 download and 100 upload. And what that means is we are now 
empowering entrepreneurs to not only be content consumers, but also content creators. Because if I'm creating content, the upload speed matters. And so we're going above and beyond because we believe that's what people deserve. And so us being able to look at what the standard is and exceeding that standard in Cleveland and informing the federal government of how to best optimally allocate scarce resources to supporting the growth of these networks, that matters. And so I couldn't be prouder of the team that we have, the decisions that we've made. And I know that the seeds that we're planting, they are fast growing because people can see the results already. And at some point, the digital C case study will be used to shape American telecommunication policy. Hmm. Lay of the Land is brought to you by Impact Architects and by 90. As we share the stories of entrepreneurs building incredible organizations in Cleveland and throughout Northeast Ohio, Impact Architects has helped hundreds of those leaders, many of whom we have heard from as guests on this very podcast, realize their own visions and build these great organizations. I believe in Impact Architects and the people behind it so much that I have actually joined them personally in their mission to help leaders gain focus, align together, and thrive by doing what they love. If you two are trying to build great, Impact Architects is offering to sit down with you for a free consultation or provide a free trial through 90, the software platform that helps teams build great companies. If you're interested in learning more about partnering with Impact Architects or by leveraging 90 to power your own business, please go to ia.layoftheland.fm. The link will also be in our show notes. Well, I, I think you've made this point that access itself is is necessary, but not sufficient. And the pandemic, I think, exacerbated the degree to which, you know, not only do you need connectivity, but you actually need a quality of it. And at the same time, I think there's this whole corollary, very related piece that speaks to the importance of of digital literacy and what you can do with the internet and connectivity mm-hmm. in addition to just access itself. And so I, I'd love to hear how you and Digital C are thinking about, you know, what it is to empower people not only with access, but but literacy in in this digital sense and and what that piece of of the equation looks like. Well, you know, this this is something where Let's go back to the 90s again. <laughs> <laughs> the information superhighway. That's what we used to call the internet. The internet at one point was information superhighway. And we looked at libraries as almost like driving centers, like a Department of Motor Vehicles, so to speak. We're like, hey, they are going to teach you how to drive on the information superhighway. So during the 90s, a lot of these libraries had computer labs. You could go in there and you could just browse for like 30 to 60 minute sessions. And, you know, they had a proctor in there just teaching you, like, what to click on and what not to click on, stuff like that. And it's funny because that model has has been one that has scaled in significance. And even during the pandemic, we saw it the most. But today, we still hold that true. Like, we are building one of the fastest freeways that many people have seen as it relates to their information. And in order to effectively build this, it requires us to be able to maximize safety. There are a lot of people who are not protected online. I mean, you can call 911 when something's going, you know, wrong or even on a real freeway, you can call 911 if you see something. Mm. Does that equivalent exist for people navigating the information superhighway? No, it does not, which is why people are getting their identity stolen, why they're getting preyed upon, why during a political election year they can't spot deep fakes and the implications there are massive, or why when the census goes exclusively online in the future and people not counting the implications there. And so now more than ever, as we're looking at building this incredible infrastructure, we had to have the complementary digital literacy and skilling piece. Thankfully, Digital C, we do that part well through our Click initiative. So Click is one of our brands. That's how we branded the digital literacy and skilling. We have a group of community partners ranging from Metro Health, the Calgary Metropolitan Housing Authority, Asbury Senior Community Center, Benjamin Rose, Amico's Foundation, Burton Bell Carr, Cleveland Public Library. I, oh, I, I did the carnal sin of naming people. Now, whoever didn't get named is going to be mad at me. <laughs> but like, <laughs> the point is, we're taking this serious. You know, we're on the ground. We understand the need. And all the intentionality we, we put on developing the network 
we're putting, if not greater intentionality on teaching people how to navigate the web safely and also to be able to do things that they've always wanted to do. You'd be surprised what some people have always just wanted to do, but were held back by their fears of technology. There are some people just like, you know what? I've always wanted to create one of those nice presentations, but I don't know how to do any of that stuff. And I, I don't really, it's like, no, we'll teach you how to do a PowerPoint. And so those are the things where like, thankfully we're at the point where the community is incredibly receptive to that. And that is a great starting point for us to then get into how someone can then navigate online banking or how someone then can apply for social service benefits that they've qualified for for so long but the barrier was online access and they didn't take full advantage of that effectively, you know, wasting taxpayer money that's allocated that never gets spent. And so the digital divide is such a force multiplier. And I would say that the digital literacy and skilling undergirds even more than the infrastructure at times, the need for that training at scale. Hmm. Well, and then on, on the flip side of it, I, I love to hear in the instances where you've been able to roll out access to folks who historically have not had it, what the downstream implications to those people have been, you know, the outcomes, the impact in their lives, the, the community stories, I, I think you've mentioned already some at a high level of what those might be from digital banking, education, you know, commerce, all these components, but make this real for us. What does this look like when people get access to internet who historically have not had it? Yeah, yeah. And this is, this is one of those beautiful things where it's either they might not have had it, or if they did have it, they weren't really taught how to fully use it. Mm. And I think that's the thing that we're also seeing too. No different than on the literacy front, we see people who know how to read maybe a Facebook post, but don't necessarily know how to read you know, something that could help better their lives from with advanced literacy. And what we call those people, they're functionally literate. That same functional equivalent it, it exists in the digital literacy side too, where people are functionally digitally literate, where they know how to create an Instagram, but they absolutely do not know how to you know, convert a Word file to a PDF for a resume submission. And those are the type of things where we see such great opportunity, but it also lies in our branding and how we you know, discuss our service, discuss our partnership and discuss our offerings. Because no one wants to be told that they're stupid. Mm. And there's a fine line in how we deliver information to people where we don't, we can't afford to come off as paternalistic because the minute we do that, we lose people. And so it's a, it's a very fine line that we have to, we can't get lost in the sauce, can't get too caught up in, well, we're doing a good thing. Yes, we might be doing a good thing, but we need to do the good thing the best way possible. Otherwise, we've now limited people in their growth and their learning because they'll just say, oh, yeah, yeah, I understand. And then they'll never come back. And they didn't fully understand either. Well, I would imagine this is, you know, partially the power of the local component of, of the whole Digital C initiative, you know, that you guys are building out of Huff and focused on the neighborhoods that you are as a starting point. I'm curious, you know, what you learned and saw, you know, in Detroit, in, in kind of kindred cities with similar histories that you feel is like extensible in the digital C narrative, you know, when you think ultimately about the kind of impact that you're having, you know, with, with maybe digital C as a, a beacon, uh, an example of, of the playbook of how to do this at, at a larger scale, how do you see, you know, the, the path forward from there? Well, I, I would say one, I shouldn't say it's great, but knowing that every city has a digital divide, every city is also different, but the digital divide seems to be eerily similar. <laughs> and so the thing is, our lessons that are learned in Cleveland, all the way from navigating the lobbying that was going against us. I mean, that's something that I don't talk about a lot, but we've been lobbied and we will continue to be lobbied heavily by people with massive advertising budgets against us. <laughs> so that is a reality that anyone who seeks to do this work, you know, we're going to show people how to do it. In addition to that, even being able to navigate with political stakeholders, messaging matters a lot. You know, we are in an election year right now. In addition to that, there's a lot of people who are hearing a whole bunch of different things. How do we take our experiences in Cleveland and inform stakeholders beyond. I mean, a digital divide in Appalachia 
is still a, a digital divide that will affect Clevelanders. A digital divide anywhere is bad for all of us everywhere. And so knowing that, I think that our approach has just been collecting as much information as possible on the ground and then seeing how that can inform our efforts while at the same time, you know, being very well aware of what are, what's happening in other cities and where we differ. I'll say that, for example, in Detroit, you know, Detroit has a very proactive community organizing scene around technology. And that made it a lot easier to do the work there. I would say that the funders were much more willing to work together. And that's not a shot at Cleveland's funders, but it's just one that Detroit rallies a bit differently. They use that negative narrative that was around Detroit for so long, all the way from National Geographic's terrible coverage of Detroit at times, and even national, other national media outlets, how they covered Detroit. They even had to apologize to it. Detroit leaned into that and built community through that struggle. So doing community building around the digital dividing in Detroit would be different from Cleveland. And that's not to say Cleveland didn't have some of that, but not nearly to the degree that Detroit did. And so I think that there's a secret recipe for whatever city you go to unlocking that thing. See, the thing about Cleveland that we, we get to unlock here is Cleveland is a, is a city of underdogs. We at Digital C understand that. We overstand that point. We know we're underdogs as it relates to this internet game or this fight. And we are committed to playing that role because that's a value that Cleveland plays. And so by aligning ourselves and knowing what these values that are intrinsic to those cities, I think that's a recipe for us having success, not even just on the digital divide, really anywhere, but especially on the digital divide as access to information is, you know, the more information you can get to people, the more you're able to get them to rally behind whatever cause you're putting in front of them. When you think about these measures of success, Across access literacy, maybe it's that 15% penetration such that you get to a level of sustainability for the organization. What does success actually look like? You know, because I, I would imagine that, again, when we kind of ground this in the, the reality of, of the world today where the internet is now considered a fundamental right, how, how is it that we get to just broad scale utility access to the internet? And, and what is what do you hope to be Digital C's role in that overall? Well, to, to your point, I mean, we, we had to start somewhere. And I think that the Digital C, we're more than a proof of concept. Uh, and as we grow and scale, people are going to see that. You know, even I, I'm, I'm going to be doing a trip to D.C. soon to be meeting with a few of our senators and other people in the House to discuss the Digital C model. And so this is planting seeds. We're moving at an incremental pace. You know, we're on the backdrop right now of the Federal Communications Commission having to discontinue the Affordable Connectivity Program. And that was a federal subsidy that was a pandemic subsidy. I mean, it was $30 a month off of people's internet bills. And Cleveland per capita is one of the highest enrolled cities in the country. And so with that, with that subsidy going away, that leaves more questions than answers. And thankfully, Digital C is one of these answers that people should look to and say, well, instead of us investing money in perpetuity, to subsidies, which doesn't actually correct the market, <clears throat> why not look at something that does disrupt the market? Why not look at something that says, man, if you build out this network, put affordability, just build it into the model, then all of a sudden we don't have to worry about every five to 10 years or so, whenever there's, God forbid, some type of tragedy, we now have to raise billions more dollars to then subsidizing something that quite frankly just needs to be disrupted. And so what we are doing right now at Digital C, success to us looks like one, first and foremost, bridging the current iteration of the digital divide, getting the people who have historically been on the wrong side, i.e. not being able to sustain a connection, not have a connection. And if they did have a connection, not having one that meets the, the standard for what is high speed internet in America. So we're solving that right now. That's the current digital divide, as well as with the digital literacy and skilling part. The digital divide is a paradigm of inequity, though. What I mean by this paradigm is what I just described as like the first side of the paradigm. There will be a paradigm shift. We see AI to be something that's phenomenal, no different than the internet, phenomenal, but it will also lead to another digital divide. And so our role in this is to, one, grow out of our current one and fight every subsequent digital divide that exists beyond our current one. And so I would say locally, you know, I think that we're going to be in the driver's seat on a lot of this stuff. And our goal would be to illuminate, illuminate Cleveland as this model that can scale with additional investment, 
you know, we what we're highlighting is a very successful foundation for a public-private partnership that absolutely can be replicated from your public stakeholders, your private stakeholders, philanthropic, and everybody essentially working together and, you know, doing so in a, such a collaborative fashion that nothing could stand in our way. This same model, if we did it for water equity, we would have it. Racial equity, we would have it. Digital equity is a first of its kind style that we're doing here. And my goal and the team's goal too is to scale this beyond and to identify any other digital divide and see if we could be the right solution for bridging that in other communities beyond Cleek. If you could, you know, wave a hypothetical magical wand and kind of institute some change in the way things work today as it relates to internet, what do you feel would be the highest impact thing that you would want to change about the way that it works? And with that, you know, what do you actually wish more people understood about access and connectivity that, that, may, that maybe we don't understand generally? I might answer this question in your reverse, because, or maybe it's one and the same, but like, look, I wish that people understood that we can demand and we deserve better. The American telecommunications system and structure is inherently non-competitive and the consumer is getting screwed every day. Hmm. That is the best way I can put it. All the promotion, <laughs> promotional stuff that people are signing up for is garbage. It's, it's just bad. And it's bad from a standpoint that you can't take such a life-saving asset that we have and then we just accept whatever is given to us. I believe that Americans, Clevelanders, Ohioans, Midwesterners, whatever, we deserve better. And it's okay to articulate that. It's okay to organize for that. And it's okay to request that. And you don't have to align yourselves with the usual suspects to get better either. There's this, this thinking, and it was repeated throughout some of the hearings that we went through last year of, well, Digital C, you guys didn't have the greatest past. And as we were scaling our company, we were figuring things out. And sometimes we were not successful with our deployments. And it was like, you know, you all don't, you guys have a challenge pass. That's what, you know, people kept bringing up. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to be like, okay, we have a challenge pass. You do realize that we're in one of the most digitally redlined cities. So where's that same animosity or investigative reporting for the people who justified our existence? Now, that doesn't make Cleveland special because, again, there's a digital divide in arguably every major American city and especially on the rural side. So it's like clearly what we've been doing hasn't worked either. And we can think bigger. We can think bolder. We can think much more disruptive. The same country that created the Internet isn't even in top 10 in the usage of the Internet. Mm. How does that make sense? And I think those are the things that we need to then have serious questions. And so I would probably say a, a magic wand, if I could just wave it, to get everybody legitimately focused on infrastructure and not shrinking to the size of a budget and being much more creative, exercising much more ingenuitive thinking around the way the telecommunication system is set up in America. Well said. <laughs> well, what, what do you feel is left unsaid about the work that you are doing, your personal journey, Digital C? You know, what, what would you want to highlight as we we kind of bookend the, the conversation here? Yeah, so I, I would say one of the big things that I like to highlight, there's a few parts of growth for us that, again, like from the nonprofit community, like I, I believe that, you know, we would like to model what, you know, an enterprise could look like. But from a startup community, we'd also like to model our journey. Mm. I mean, this was an, an organization that in the past, we, <laughs> we inbounded all of our customer service calls. And like that just made it a um, a very interesting process to manage. We now outsource that to the Cleveland Site Center. That is a local nonprofit that employs people with, with visual impairments. Mm -hmm. And what a great story to be able to tell there that even in our outsourcing, we're doing responsible outsourcing. We're doing local outsourcing. You know, we just brought on a new customer relationship management tool that allows us to seamlessly and use automation to contact and enroll customers in our service. We are growing in our, not only just in the size of our company, but in the way that we operate. That overnight, people are judging us from what we were in the past of this nonprofit trying to figure things out. You know, we're still tripping over our own feet. And now we might stumble every now and then, 
But the progress that we've been able to make with such an incredible team, I mean, I keep highlighting Jose Valdez, but there's others. There's Valerie Jerome, who's my chief of marketing communications. I've known her for a very long time. There's just people throughout this organization who care. And the way that they care is unrivaled. And that's why I believe that we're having a lot of success. What, what else do you feel in this kind of nonprofit as a startup thinking that you've you know, learned along the way that it was surprising to you, you know, that, that you didn't expect that you see, f- see in reflection? I would say that there's nothing impossible. I think that's where we were struggling with in the past. In the past, man, I mean, you, you'll identify a task. Like we had to actually change our entire payment architecture. That is not easy to do for any industry. Mm-hmm. And absolutely for ours, I mean, you're trying to, one, enroll customers in a service while you're changing your payment architecture. And, you know, we have this approach. And I, I learned this from one of my old bosses in Detroit. Uh, her name is Beth Niblock. She's the current chief information officer for the U.S. Housing Urban Development Department. But Beth was incredible because she used an acronym, JFDI. Just do it and you can guess what the F meant. And her, <laughs> that attitude is one that, you know, I've taken with me and alongside my, my counterpart, Jose, we even still that attitude within the team where it's like, look, whatever mountain is in front of us, just climb it. Whatever problem is, just deal with it. Just, just do it and do it again and again and again. And what I've been surprised by is like, when you adopt that mentality, the pace that you can move at, I mean, it took us years on our legacy network. Digital C started building a network in the uh, beginning of 2018. And by 2022, we covered 22,500 households or approximately 23,000, whatever. Within one quarter, within one quarter of this year, we now cover approximately 18,000 households. And so it's like, wow, Mm -hmm. what it took us to do in years, we've done in one quarter. Like that is unheard of, the pace that we're moving at and the way that we've been able to evolve. But a lot of that rests in the mentality. So the biggest thing I can say for any, you know, startup, nonprofit, whomever, it's like, just do it. Whatever goal you think it is, whatever thing that's challenging you, it doesn't matter. Just do it. Just get it done. You will figure it out. And you have to trust that you will. And you have to trust that the people around you will support you in doing so. Yeah. Again, well said. I think that that resonates quite deeply. In, uh, and it's something that, that we need here. You know, just, just raise the bar for ambition and what I think collectively we, we could accomplish. So that's awesome. Well, I'll... Uh, Turn to our, our traditional closing question, which is for a hidden gem in Cleveland for something that other people may not know about in the city, but perhaps they should. Oh, uh, I knew you were going to ask this question. And I, I, I've, <laughs> been struggling about the, I've been struggling with this one, to be honest, because I, 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 have, I have a few. One, I love the marina area off of East 55th, the pier. I think, I mean, I, I, obviously Edgewater gets love. But like sitting on those rocks over there when there's like a, a sunset, oh my gosh, that is that is beautiful. I know people love them and it's I, I feel cliche by saying them, but the cultural gardens, I just think like that whole area just speaks to me. I love the university circle area. Then in Tremont, you have like those swings that are overlooking like the flats that are right on the edge. Like there's like these wooden swings that you can sit on. Mm. And I think it's magical to, again, a sunset over there is is beautiful and this is so awful for for me to mention this one because it's not even in cleveland but like Cuyahoga valley national park happy days is my favorite park by far the story alone it's incredible but like the octagon area with the overlook that area has always spoke to me i love the i love like the fact that the glaciers shape that entire area it speaks to me and so I did have to cheat by going outside of Cleveland on that one, but it's still Cuyahoga. And I think that anyone in Cleveland should honor William Stinchcomb, the founder of the the Metro Parks tradition and preserving our emerald necklace. And I do believe that we should um, explore more nature. So, yeah. Absolutely. All great call-outs. Well, Joshua, I just want to thank you again for coming on, sharing your story. I think the really impactful and important work that you're, you're doing at Digital C is awesome to to follow along on. Oh no, I, I I appreciate it. I'm thankful for you know obviously any and any and all opportunities to share a story and obviously reconnecting with you. 
that's been a while, but you know, it was really great being able to do this interview and I appreciate the work that you're doing in amplifying just better storytelling in Cleveland and beyond. It's, it's truly my pleasure. If people had anything that they wanted to follow up with you about, learn more about Canopy, learn more about Click, learn more about Digital C, what direction would you point them? Well, first, I'd point them to our new website, um, www.digitalc.org. That is a new one. We take great pride in that. Valerie on our RR team internally did a phenomenal job. They can also follow us on Instagram. It's, uh, you can just search Digital C. Uh, we pop up. And then in addition to that, if they want to inquire about our service or even just hear about our professionalism, they can call our hotline at 216-777-3859. It's one of the luckiest phone numbers in Cleveland. So give it a call. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you again, Josh. Seven seven seven. It is it is a memorable number. It's it's it kinda... is. Like my mind went zero zero zero. I'm like, no, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for this week. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show. So if you have any feedback, please send over an email to jeffrey at layoftheland.fm or find us on Twitter at podlayoftheland or at sternhefe, J-E-F-E. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please reach out as well and let us know. And if you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or on your preferred podcast player. Your support goes a long way to help us spread the word and continue to bring the Cleveland founders and builders we love having on the show. We'll be back here next week at the same time to map more of the land. The Lay of the Land podcast was developed in collaboration with the Up Company LLC. At the time of this recording, unless otherwise indicated, we do not own equity or other financial interests in the company which appear on the show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of any entity which employs us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.